Hello, and welcome to Piano Tech Radio Hour, the weekly bridge to the future of the Piano Tech community. I'm David Anderson. And I'm Ethan Janney. And we're here to ask great questions, and then we'll shut up and listen to some of the authorities, experts, and most outstanding personalities in our little world of pianos. So, put on your best set of headphones, and let's get started. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome again to Piano Tech Radio Hour. Good to see you. Glad to have you join us once again. Pleasure as always. Um, very excited about our guest today. Uh, we'll take a minute or two just to let people uh, stream in and, and uh, find their bearings. Um, if you're out there on Facebook or YouTube, um, just remember, we'd love to have you join us right here on the Zoom call. Um, you know, maybe there's even a moment to ask a question or make a comment in the chat here, and that's awesome. Um, so we will share a link for you to join us here in Zoom, and I encourage you to click on that and, and hop in. And um, we'll get started here in, in a minute or two. And uh, if you are out on Facebook and YouTube and you write a comment, we should also be able to see that. We've got somebody monitoring those chats, and, and they can share that with me, so... If, if, if you're out there, you, you can chime in and, and uh, you'll be heard and we'll try to serve your comments and questions if you have them. All right. Well, I want to get into this pretty quick. Sometimes I take a little bit more time to let folks in. Um, but today I'm, I'm excited about our guests and men. I've just read an entire book. So I know we will not be able to read that entire book um, in an hour, but I have enough information to share for several hours we could cover. So uh, I think it'd be fun to dive in. So I will do the intro to today's session and also intro our guests and, and we'll dive right in. So uh, you are now a, a part of Piano Tech Radio Hour. Welcome. What we do here is we gather every Saturday to meet with and learn from the most fascinating and knowledgeable folks in the piano world. This might include manufacturers, rebuilders, musicians, makers of other instruments, of course, piano techs. Our mutual goal here is to become better at a craft, to help each other, and to create an ever more musical world together. Piano Tech Radio Hour is brought to you by Piano Technicians Masterclasses. These are online learning resources that bring you cutting edge instruction from piano industry masters without leaving your home. You can find out more about that at pianotechniciansmasterclass.com. And you can also subscribe to just this program that happens every Saturday and goes out as a podcast. Uh, and you subscribe to that for just $16 a month. What happens there is you get direct access to each week's private Zoom call. So you'd be on Zoom with us right now, eat quickly and easily. Um, as well as our Kava recordings of over 190 episodes in our member area. And uh, that would include this one and everything since we started. Um, and you can join Piano Tech Radio Hour by going to bit.ly forward slash join PTRH. That's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash join P-T-R-H. And uh, I will put a spotlight now. I'll add a spotlight to our guest today. And I'll do an intro to him and we'll dive into the conversation as well as we got some fun uh, surprises uh, uh, from his work. Uh, so here we go. Let's intro uh, Jim Wilson. He is a true renaissance man in the world of music uh, from his early days in Texas, where a chance encounter with the guitar ignited a lifelong passion for music. Uh, to his groundbreaking work with MIDI technology that bridged the gap between acoustic pianos and the digital age. Jim's journey is a study, I would say, in synchronicity. Jim is a tale of perseverance, powerful friendships, and a relentless commitment to one's dreams. After moving to California, wanting to become a star, he found his calling in the world of piano tuning, transforming the sound of pianos for a clientele that reads literally like a who's who of the music industry. And that includes legends like Paul McCartney, Elton John, Carol King, many more. Um, his commitment to integrity, excellence, and his collaborative go for it spirit led him to incredible opportunities. Notably, he was invited to play a key role in the development of a revolutionary MIDI adapter for acoustic pianos. This forever changed the way these instruments interact with technology and 
forever changed Jim's life. He was rapidly catapulted into the circles of history's key musical and cultural influencers. Beyond his contributions to tech evolution, Jim is a celebrated composer and musician. Four of his 10 recordings hit the Billboard Top 20. His music has been streamed over 75 million times worldwide, earning him a lifetime membership in the Recording Academy. Jim's work has not only catapulted uh, or has not only captured the hearts of listeners, but also been featured in television series and garnered him to PBS specials. All this would never have happened without Jim's willingness to face his own fear and self-doubt head on. Jim also collaborated with Spectrasonics on the Keyscape virtual instrument library as an expert in optimizing keyboard instruments for sampling. Keyscape samples feature Jim's personal customized Yamaha C7, which means the sound of his personal piano can be heard on world-class recordings everywhere and in perpetuity. Jim's upcoming memoir, which is now uh, for pre-sale on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, is called Tuned In Memoirs of a Piano Man. It promises to be a revealing look at his life from his humble beginnings to his rise as a multi-award winning recording artist. It's a story of personal tragedy, self-discovery, and unyielding belief in the power of music. With endorsements from a constellation of A-list celebrities, the book is a reflection of Jim's impact on music and the people who make it. Jim, I'm sure it's fun to hear all that uh, in one breath. Uh, welcome to Piano Tech Radio. It's good to have you here. <laughs> Thank you for having me. That's, that's an amazing introduction and thorough. Do we have enough time left over for the podcast or is that Not much? That's a wrap. Been nice Thank you, everybody. You. It was really great to so. see you and I uh, appreciate <laughs> you tuning in. <laughs> Thank you for those that uh, for sure. glowing introduction. It's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, a lot. There's a lot. Um, I I got you to send me a copy of the book. Got it right here. Yeah, and nice. uh, and I was really happy that we made that happen. That we arranged this interview with time for me to to dive into it. Um, yeah. And uh, and I furiously wanted to finish it before we talked. Uh, so I just finished like the the last couple of pages last night, and uh, it was great. Yeah, like I said, a lot of great stories, and I think. We'll find out more about it. I think yeah. there's certain books that every piano technician is probably going to read. You know, you got the piano shop on the left bank, you know. You got Reblets. You got Reblets. Technical stuff, you know. Yeah, you got yeah. Mario E. Grack. Um, but Romance on Three Legs. Yep. Right. And and this is going to be one of them. I, I'm pretty positive. Oh, man. You know, it's, it's inspiring. Uh, and I think, too, which is really exciting for you, even though it's about a piano tuner's journey, it really has that connection just to the general human uh, struggle that I think people from all walks of life can enjoy. Yeah. Well, you're you're right. You know, the the genesis of this is um, around the beginning of the pandemic. I I thought, well, I got no excuse now. I've got plenty of time to start cobbling together these stories and because um, I've been told so many times over the years, oh my God, you need to put some of these stories down on paper. So I, I did, and it soon became apparent. It's, it's a lot more than just a collection of fun stories. It's about my, my journey as an artist, you know, and, and how this wonderful craft of ours, this amazing craft of ours has led to all these extraordinary opportunities. And, you know, it was a sort of jump into that, how that came to be. I was playing in, in bands back in Texas and the keyboard players could tune pianos. And I went with uh, Charlie Clinton, the keyboard player for the band Easy, when he went off to tune a piano. And I thought, man, if he could do that, I can do it too. And what a great way to earn 25 bucks. I mean, living in a high cotton, man, 25 bucks for a tuning? Come on, that's, that's big money. And uh, so I decided to approach it methodically. And I wrote to all the piano tuning schools in America. I found this list of 20 different schools, 17 of the letters that I hand wrote came back to me, moved, no forwarding address, no longer in existence. So it came down to really just three of them. Um, I, the Bennett, I think, and Perkins School of Piano Tuning and Technology in Cleveland was the direction I decided to go. So my God, what a, just a, it, what a what a great craft we have. Just a, a second, because this audience is the the perfect audience for for this, and I think about this honestly all the time, how amazing is our craft that 
just mere virtue of the fact that um, people that we are in their universe, it's because they value music so highly, they're willing to spend a lot more than a normal instrument and take up a big chunk of their living room, or whatever. So you start with that and it speaks to their values and that's the people whose universe we're in. And as you sort of go up the food chain a bit more and more discriminating clients and artists, ultimately, um, you are in a higher jet stream and people who spend a hundred thousand, a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars on a piano. And you're the, you're the trusted caretaker of their instrument, you know? What uh, an amazing thing and how it changed my life and put me into all these incredible opportunities, all because, you know, I saw these guys tuning a piano. I thought if they learned it, I can learn it too, you know? So mm -hmm. here's to our craft. I agree. Um, it's, uh, the, but you, you, you said, we've been talking a little bit over the past couple of weeks, and I think you've yeah. said this a few times. Uh, the first time you said it, I asked for clarification, and I'm glad, you know, to, to, to get through the details. You just said, says something about someone's values if they have a piano. Yeah. And I love to sort of uh, sort of simmer on that a little bit. Um, yeah. It's it's like you said, you, it, you have to go the extra mile to appreciate it. It's like somebody having a fine painting in their house, right? They, they put the effort, the time, the access income to say, hey, you know what? This is important to me. I want to feature it. I want to be part of my life. And um, and I think interestingly, like the the way your book unfolds too, the higher you go into the artists that um, have had great success, a lot of these folks are not. I mean, they've made they've made money, so they have they they need to do something with it. But I think it's a principle they've had since before they did was to invest in the things that go beyond money, right? And so you can somebody that's invested this much in their art in their in their creativity um in that non-tangible part of life right and you show somebody like you a great genuine guy that that uh that's just great to be around i'm sure it from the book you notice they also notice that and they don't just want to have you tune their piano because the whole thing goes well beyond transactions and money and, and all that stuff it goes into just humanity right and uh, I think that's that added piece of what do people value? It's an object. Piano is an object, but owning one means you treasure something special about the human experience, I would say. Yes. Often you do develop relationships with with these people, you know, piano owners and, and artists. You have to kind of follow their lead. There's nothing worse than somebody coming in and sort of immediately becoming overly friendly and it's like, oh, God, how do I get rid of this person, you know? But if you, you know, many times I'm kind of ushered in by a recommendation by a higher level artist and and there's already this wonderful understanding, you know. Queen Latifah recently called her friend Quincy Jones and said, who's who's a good technician? And you got to get Jim Wilson. So that was a different kind of intro than me just seeing her on the street and going, I'm a big fan of your... You know, there's this wonderful uh, intro where there's there's respect and and, you know, I, I love connecting with people. And if the opportunity is there, I'll go for it. If if not, I try to just follow their lead. And but what a what a great profession that we have that we can deal with with uh, musically inclined people and artists, you know. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure today I've noticed, like going through the book, there's a lot of themes that we run across over and over again, having done over 190 episodes here about mm -hmm. kind of what emerges um, as wisdom. And I think um, also a piece of what you're talking about, too, is what we do is not a, com a commodity or, mm -hmm. you know, or you can think of it beyond a commodity. It's not like, oh, OK, this piano tuner, I need a piano tuner. Should I get this one or that one or that one? They're all right. the same. Which one's the cheapest or whatever. Right. It it matters who's doing it and their approach to the whole thing. And I'm sure that's part of your experience as well. You know, there are some people that will appreciate a Jim Wilson as their technician of choice. And there's somebody that will appreciate, you know, Franz Moore as their technician of choice or, you know, somebody else. And I feel like understanding that we've we've encountered this sort of wisdom of our profession, understanding that 
you as a technician, once you have that base level of understanding and you care about your craft, you need to sort of re reach in and say, what's special about me? Um, because it's a, that's a part of what you're doing. Yeah. Um, we, we thought we would share um, a little book excerpt up mm -hmm. front so people can know exactly what we're talking about. And I wanted to do something special for this because, like you said, you're the perfect guest. <laughs> and it's exciting to see you put something together. You're a perfect guest for this show. Um, so I actually did a reading from the prologue of your book. And it's about like 12 minutes long. So we're not going to play the whole thing right now. We'll play about the first two minutes. And, and then we'll come back and have the conversation. But just to give people a taste of kind of the content of the book in its raw form. And then when we're done with the conversation, we'll use that as a bit of an epilogue to this program. We'll play out with the remaining, you know, 10 minutes or so of that. So if people are interested, they can dive deeper in. So why don't we go to that right now? And then we'll come back to some conversation. Sound good? Right. All right. Perfect. So we'll get that media player going, share the audio. And as always, folks, if you can't hear something or see something right, you let me know on that end, because I can't always tell how it comes through on your side. Here we go. You must be Jim. He calls me by name. And just like that, I'm once again the eight-year-old boy who obsessed over this icon's hit songs. The pudgy kid who yearned to enrapture fans with music. The dreamer whose life direction was shaped by the trail this legend blazed. It feels like I have cotton in my mouth. Amazingly, my lips move. Words come out. And I'm guessing you must be, uh, I want to say, Paul? He laughs and extends his hand. My anxiety begins to ease. Just. I've met and worked for quite a number of celebrities by now, but this is Paul McCartney. A freaking beetle. His music has underscored my whole life, made me cry, laugh, sing at the top of my lungs, worked its way deep into my musical DNA. This is like meeting Mozart, Gandhi, and Obi-Wan Kenobi rolled into one. I mean, here's a guy who's literally changed the world with his music. But I don't have the luxury of succumbing to nervousness. I'm here on a limited mission to install an adapter in Paul McCartney's piano and show him how to work it. Thankfully, I can speak with assuredness about the adapter installation. I even suggest ways I could improve the touch and tone of his Hamburg Steinway B grand piano. Have I overstepped my bounds? But he smiles. Have at it, he says. We agree to meet the following morning, and I ask what time. Tennis anyone? He gets a grin and his iconic raised eyebrow. That a figure from the musical version of Mount Rushmore enjoys a corny dad joke puts me further at ease. All right. <laughs> uh, uh, so as the I kind of, as I kind of say in that, in what you just read there's there's meeting celebrities and there's meeting like major celebrities there's meeting royalties and there's meeting a beetle i mm -hmm. mean it's for any of us who grew up with their music you know it's so deeply ingrained into our dna and they're such mythological characters and then to actually see uh him face to face and he's very present he's very alive and jocular and it's like wow it's you know it, it took me a minute to <laughs> I, I was relieved to f see my mouth moving and actual human words coming out and but the next day as we'll find out i was a little bit more present and it's like okay this is going down and it turned into this magical four-hour hang of singing beatles songs and telling stories and you know just the incredible hang and him ending that with uh anytime you're in the uk just give us a bell and I would like a dozen times go to his Homer studio and and it's in the limo ride back to London where I'm thinking, how the hell does an insecure West Texas kid end up here? So, yeah. Yeah. And there's a there's a hint of that, which I think is a theme in the book, which is great, which, again, is a theme that we've gone through, especially 
uh, you know, David Anderson, who, who kind of helped launch this thing, was was integral into some of these themes that of wisdom that we covered. Um, you're here. Um, yeah, you're here. Raise a glass to David. For sure. Yeah. Um, like a fearlessness, you know, not a fearlessness that you're not afraid in the first place, but to just kind of be willing to push through the voices in your head that say you're not you know, good enough. Do it or, anyway. Do it, you're going to do it anyway. Yeah. And hey, I love that. Um, well, wonderful. So you guys have a taste of that. Um, and we will, um, I, I will, I guess I'll jump right into it because I thought this was great when I got in there. Like, I don't know what this book about a piano tuner's life is going to be like. You know, it could be relatively boring, I'll be honest with you. Right? Right. Oh, I tuned this cool person's piano. I turned this yes. cool piano. Okay, great. Okay, great. Okay, great. So we get to the point where you move to LA. And again, you're just this kid uh, c- coming off the boat. You know, just you drove. You drove, though, from, from Texas. And you show up. And within a few weeks, you're like hanging out with celebrities you're you're dating like a playboy cover girl who's a, been a playmate of the year like <laughs> and so pretty quickly you go okay this is not just going to be about like pianos it's really right. um there's really some fun stuff in there you know you 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 talk about you know some trouble that you made as a kid yeah. um and uh in in there's a real story there. there's something real adventure um in it so can you talk a little bit about um that that transitional period of getting to LA and like how that all emerged. Yeah. So I did this two day drive in January of 1979 from Amarillo, Texas to Los Angeles. And I arrived at 6 PM on a Monday night and my new roommate to be Mark Hinton. Uh, he says, Hey, listen, there's this band playing. Let's go hear them. It's Monday, six o'clock. Three hours later, 9 p.m. that Monday night, we're hearing these guys. They're all studio musicians. And every single one of them is at the top of their game. They just do this band for fun. It's called Just for Grins. So every single one of them would have a piano. Every single one would be friends and big champions of my work. And so every single one of those was like planting a little acorn seed, which evolved into this, grew into this incredible uh, tree. One of whom was Scott Page who is, uh, I know that you know, he's he's a force of nature. And, uh, but so each one of those guys that this one would lead to, Scott Page would lead for me tuning for Seals and Croft, you can remember them, and Super Tramp. And then that one would lead to another person, which would lead to tuning for Chick Corea for 14 years. He was uh, uh, my client for that long, all nine of his pianos. <laughs> and, um, and so on. So, you know, that was... Um, it was a fun way to enter into the LA, um, you know, scene, but you know, what a, what a scene it is, you know, it's a big town, it's a megapolis and it'll swallow you up whole. And, uh, I got very fortunate and was able to get a little toehold and establish a business, even if it did ultimately kind of lead me off track of my original dream, which, as I say in the book, um, the original dream was to become the next Jackson Brown. And instead, I became the next Jackson Brown piano tuner. So that was uh, an evolution that took place over another decade or more. Yeah. Um, you also have, just to give people a sense of the the things that are going on in the book. I mean, one, we, we get to start. I finished it, so I'm realizing I'm a little bit more on the middle and end. But like, we get to start with you just as a kid. And kind of, you know, some difficulties that you encountered. So, you know, living in a house where you didn't have a bedroom and, uh, you know, you, you sort of pull a, you know, a coup d'etat at some point and like <laughs> unload some closet so you can have some privacy, you know, like it, right. it was one of those places where, where things, you know, weren't perfect. And you had to kind of find that connection to your inner self and believe that you could move on to better stuff. Um, and you also... Uh, have a propensity for setting things on fire um <laughs> as, as a kid I, I, maybe it's worth sharing this story I mean, there's two stories of setting things on fire there's i don't know if you made that connection but i did if with your father you know yes, as well as the gershwin's uh gershwin's piano. oh yes oh, okay funny okay 
So tell yeah, us about that. Quite, uh, and why are you such a pyromaniac? Pyromaniac. How did what's going on there? What's going on with that? Um, well, the uh, the the, the Gershwin piano. We should start there. Or the 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 Let's dad thing was when I was a kid and uh, I guess ten years old or twelve or something like that. And uh, my dad was living out in the country and he had just finished this addition to his his stables and there's 12 new horse stables and there's a pile of sawdust in one of them and um, my friend who'd come in uh come up from out of uh in the city to hang out with me over the weekend were smoking cigarettes and putting them out on the ground near the sawdust nice good call and that ultimately led to burning down my dad's stable which it's still just it hurts to even think of it because my dad was really struggling trying to make it and here's this knucklehead kid just doing this idiot thing and and it resulted in a big setback for him but uh, and then you alluded to the other little uh, issue was so my business was kind of taking off in LA we're jumping ahead a couple of decades many years yeah many years and um Somehow or another, I I got a new client, uh, Engelbert Humperdinck, and he's saying, oh, "This is the this is the nine foot Steinway that that Gershwin wrote Rhapsody in Blue on." And, wow, that, he won it in an auction or something like that. And um, how do you like it? I said, "Well, it's you know the action's a little tough. The hammers need replacing." And so I took the action back to my. He said, "Yes, let's do it." And and uh, so I took the action back to my little apartment in North Hollywood and put it on the, the I didn't have a shop at that time. I just put it on the, the little glass table, kitchen table. And and so um, my new assistant, I'm working on traveling the hammer shanks as you sometimes do either with a, a heat gun, definitely preferred, or a, just for a quick thing, you do the matches. Well, this was done at the same time that my, assistant was was uh, using naphtha on the the sluggish uh flanges and uh one need not to imagine too much what what happened then it's like this big flame it was a very quick little thing and it got put out quite easily but man has it uh my friend david who would become a successful tv writer he he dined out on that story hey did i ever tell you the story about setting engelbert humperdinck's piano on fire yeah ultimately it wasn't as bad as as the the tale of your childhood um yeah. and, and, yeah. Yeah. and your friend <laughs> kind of overdid it made it sound like the ceiling got full of soot and things but um, but I think sharing that uh, that story and many others uh, from your childhood were, were very instrumental because, you know, I feel I realized I came at it with sort of a, jo a jocular tone, but that was such a um, probably very difficult moment. And uh, you can really sense it. I've had similar, you know, similar experiences myself, family members, which you, you've had experiences with family members, too, uh, where there's just a sense of being a little bit lost, you know, of where is this all going, you know, just kind of have it, maybe have a little too much fun or not knowing what the right boundaries were and things like that. So that, I think that was one of those circumstances where you learned a big lesson in, in kind of like having more responsibility. Your dad had you kind of work, work off the, the damage over time. And as you said, it's, it sounds like, somebody building a stable it's kind of some sort of, it's, it almost can sound like some rich kid type of thing oh dad was building a stable on the farm and it, it, you know when you read the story it's more like wow he's 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 really struggling and and that was taking him in a deeper hole um what do you what can you say about that transition for yourself um kind of a taking responsibility because when you you can tell when you start working on pianos. I can feel it in the way you're describing what you're doing. You're really taking it seriously, and you and music too. Like you, you're practicing like very intensely for hours at a time to perfect things on the guitar. And so I think there's like this certain sense of of uh, hard work that's in there yeah. too that yeah. you gained. Can you talk about like what that transition was like? Was it was it gradual? Was it overnight? What was that like? Well, a lot of who I am, Ethan, is is kind of based on in, in opposition to my dad 
you know, I love my dad. He was a great, great guy, but he was a bit of a dreamer and he had 26 different occupations. He could never stick with anything. And so I, I was cut, got a little bit allergic to him saying, well, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to do. And he never quite got around to it. Mm -hmm. So as much as I loved him, I also took the lesson of, dude, if you're going to do this, just fucking get on with it and, and don't make any excuses, just do it. So there was that part of me that came to know that if you're going to make something happen, go all in. So that's kind of been the theme of my life. And, um, you know, piano tuning was just going to be a little means to support myself in L.A. while, uh, you know, doing pursuing my music dreams. But as long as I was in piano tuning school in Cleveland, Ohio, yes, I'm only there for learning tuning, but hey, they've got this additional thing for grand restoration. It's like, okay, I'll never use this, but why not? So, and that was, um, it, that really obviously turned into the the skills that uh, would take me to the next level. You know, there's there's tuning and that's really wonderful. There are a lot of studio tuners out here who just tune and don't do any regulation or voicing, but I'm... Um, I was so grateful that I did get a little taste for the upper levels of piano care. And uh, as we know, as you advance and get better and better at what you do, there's a little bit of paint by number. You can actually, if you can tune a good unison and you have a good ETD, you can do a certainly a, a very passable tuning. But you, the more understanding that you have about what it is that you're trying to accomplish, and and I think becoming a better pianist will help you as a, to become a better piano technician, because you start to appreciate distinctions. So the more I evolved as a an artist, the better technician I would become, and and vice versa. But that's always fed, that's always mm -hmm. served me well. That kind of determined uh the determinism to become better and better at whatever it is i'm doing mm -hmm. and uh, i pulled out a quote from the book which i think is a good transition um i love this and this is another place where i see a theme at least for myself that i've pulled out of these sessions you know with piano experts yeah. and masters right. right in line with this when you're 95 percent done this is you're talking about you're actually talking about um mixing audio at the time yeah. but you're also saying that you think about piano work this way and i love yeah. this when you're 95 percent done you're halfway there yeah. the difference between good and great is that extra attention to detail yeah. given near the end and uh i wholeheartedly concur with yeah. that not only from my own experience but what I see in the people that really excel, but I also think it's, it's like, it's something that's a little bit hard to take on, you know, cause there's so much pressure to be like, okay, it's about 95%. Let's move on to the next thing. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. Can you talk a little bit about what you see in those things? What are those things that you do? Are there times where you have a second thought? Oh, should I do this? Shouldn't I? But yeah, no, let me do it. Like what kind of things do you pay attention to in, in tuning and elsewhere? My friend Scott Wrights, this wonderful piano technician here in LA, he's uh, he's kind of like you. He reminds me of you, young and very deliberate about his choice of being a piano tuner, and he's he's really good. And he, as we know, we talk about circles of refinement. So there's the first pass through where with a regulation, let's say, let off, drop, hammerline, spring tension, uh, etc., where you get it all really, really close. And let's face it, 95% of the people will go, oh, that's fantastic. But when you're dealing with artists and you want to kind of strive to be the best you can be and to get this thing really dialed in, you start appreciating little nuances of, man, when I get the, the whip and screw really snug, it gives a nice foundation and you feel that. And when you take out the slop in the upstop rail and you you kind of get, get things really dialed in and the, the let off is nice and consistent all the way through and not excessive aftertouch and all those things. And 
the the more refined it is the and the same thing with tone you know it's getting a general tone set up and the more you get that really defined in and and uh when it's really right and the next level and you've taken it from that 95 percent to 99 is there ever really 100 you know as, as we say in the music world no mix is ever done only abandoned so i suppose to some degree it's kind of like that with uh with pianos but mm. but yeah there's that i love that that uh i i had this realization that when you're 95 percent done you're halfway there and it is that additional um little level of refinement that that takes it where it's wow it's amazing it's it's just glorious experience when you're a pianist to sit down and the touch is really smooth and inviting and and the tone is rich and warm and it's, it still it has this nice vibrancy on the high end and you know it's just it's a magical thing and, and that's that's another aspect of our craft is that we're dealing with this intangible element of sound, this auditory world, you know? It's yeah. Amazing. And I have a thought of it, and, and I'm not quite clear on how I want to approach it. Like, I'm always refining how I approach this topic, too. So I'm curious. I want to get some feedback from you. Because one of the ways that I think about it is if I'm asking myself, does this really matter? Does this really make a difference? Like, I'm literally, like, maybe I'm listening to something. It's like, the difference yeah. between this and this and that, you know? Yeah. That I go... Let's just pretend there is and let's right. get it how you want it. Right. Do you find that too? Like where you reach this like level where you're so close that you can't tell if you're making a difference, but ultimately when you step away from it, all those little things you've done, you go, that must have done something. It, they absolutely do. And I, I love all those little things that are really subtle, but in the gestalt view and the bigger view, they do add up and, and it's, it's a magical thing for somebody who can appreciate it. And especially when you're dealing with kind of higher end artist, I know that every technician who's listening knows there's no better feeling in the world when somebody entrusts you. It's like, so you need, you say it needs regulation voicing. I'm not sure exactly what all that in, involves, but yes, go for it. Or you've restored a piano. It's the family piano. And, um, I'll bet you anything there's there's techs out there listening who've had that experience of they sit down to play it and they they weep because and the 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 words I love the most are I can't believe it's the same piano. So that's when all those little nuancey things uh, add up, you know, leveling the strings and getting getting a, a really nice um solid contact. You know, um I've had the good fortune of working for so many great artists. And as I said, from, from day one, I was kind of thrust into that jet stream. And one of the clients is, that I was uh, fortunate enough to work for was uh, Chick Corea. And I had the good sense to know when I was in over my head, you know, I could handle the the basics, but when it came down to geometry, I was, you know, I was a newbie and I had the good sense to reach out to, the veterans, Richard Davenport and uh, Norm Neblett and bring them in on the job and make it worth their while financially. And I learned so much from them and um, that whole, you know, circle of refinement and getting a little bit better and better. And, and they, they've been uh, great, great um, inspirations to me. So by the way, I, um, <clears throat> I encourage all people also read the book because it's kind of fun. You have the celebrities in there that everybody knows about. And then also our little local celebrities in the piano industry. Um, yeah. I know Eric Johnson's on the call today. I'm glad you joined Eric. Eric's been on Radio Hour a few times. I and he has. excellent technician and great stories to tell as well. Um, but it's fun to book. see. Yeah, I, I saw his name there when you were talking about uh, connecting Elton John with Yamaha for, for pianos. And that was, that was a fun yeah. moment as well. <laughs> yeah, that that was a fun little thing. So i would gotten to do a lot Eric, of work for El. Let me bring Eric on real quick. He's saying hi. Look it, he's Look he's in he's in the thick man. of it. He's in the thick of it. I'm he's working. got a, he's got I, a I'm smock working on. Here. He's got. I'm not sitting around talking. I'm working. Hey Jim, <laughs> how you doing, I, buddy? 
I'm good, man. I've really enjoyed it, uh, and I'm looking forward to reading your book. I'm really enjoying this session today. Great job getting uh, getting him on, Ethan. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. You, good Eric. to see you, Eric. We'll let you get back to work. <laughs> get yeah, back to work. Just, get get yeah. back to work. We want to get that regulation just right. Um, but there's, I, you know, I in the 80s, I helped to develop the first media adapter. We can circ circle back to this, but yeah, it was the right place at the right time. And which led to because I at, really at the whole genesis of MIDI at all, mm -hmm. I was right out of the gate with this MIDI adapter for acoustic piano. So before you could even explain to people what this MIDI adapter for acoustic piano was, you had to explain this new thing called MIDI. So that led to me being flown to England a dozen times by McCartney and Elton and Phil Collins, et cetera. But uh, I had gotten to do a lot of work for Elton, gained his respect. And he played a, a certain piano, which shall remain nameless. And through no fault of that company's, somebody had messed up the, the geometry on a Steinway. As, as everybody listening knows, if you get those action rails off literally by a millimeter you instead of a 113 spread you have a you know maybe a 1 1 11 spread or the other way around it can play like a truck you know so unfortunately somebody had had messed that up and the geometry is now off and uh elton i was working on his piano he goes wilson these keys feel like the bloody concrete <laughs> I said, well, you know, I, I'd be happy to work on that. We'd probably need the piano, you know, in my shop, and I'd be happy to dial that in for you. And he said, well, next time you're, next time you are interested and you're not, you know, you have a little bit of a window, we can take the piano at my shop, and I can put you in touch with the people at Yamaha, who I'm sure would be happy to have you try their their pianos. He had kind of an older view of Yamaha it hadn't been entirely possible at that point but I said no this is this is not your grandfather's Oldsmobile to use a very ancient reference uh it's they've made incredible strides they listen to artists they listen to technicians and um he said yeah okay maybe I'll give that a go a week later or so hey Jim it's Keith Bradley calling from the road Elton wants to take you up on your offer and uh, he would like to try this Yamaha. I said, oh, that's great. When are you thinking? He said, well, tomorrow night in New Orleans. <laughs> okay. So I looked at the clock and uh, I saw it was one o'clock in LA. I thought, oh, that means it's 4 p.m. And so I called Eric in uh, New York. He was the head of CNA for Yamaha at the time. I said, um, so how would you like to have Elton John as a Yamaha artist? fantastic what do we got to do well we got to get a piano to new orleans tomorrow so boom he jumped into action and found a cna nine foot there and i did an all-nighter I, I flew from la new orleans i arrived at nine in the morning took the red eye went straight to the stadium went straight to the piano started working on it. I took the action apart, just made the friction minimal and even and regulated and done, did a little bit of voicing and installed the MIDI adapter. So by the time Elton walked in at 2 p.m., he sat down and I, he started playing. He goes, oh, this this is lovely. I said, yeah. Um, well, when you, you know, whenever I get your other piano, I can kind of get the same sort of down weight, this 49 down and 28 up. And, you know, we can get your action there feeling great too. He goes, no, I think I'll just give it to charity. And from that moment forward, that little nanosecond of him playing that, that glorious thing of a perfect touch weight, this, you know, wonderful 49 down and 28 up. And, and he just, uh, he, uh, he became a Yamaha artist from that moment on. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's like I said, you, there's these several moments that you mentioned in the book several times, to be honest. It's very impressive where it, it might be practicing a riff, you know, practicing a song, preparing for a concert, 
you know, doing a gig that you said you could do, but you were just sort of on the edge of being able to do it, but you just pull it all together, <laughs> yeah. um, where you just kind of, you zone in and you go the extra mile, you push yeah. past the little bit of resistance and self-doubt. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I really like those moments in there. Lovely. Um, it's very inspiring. Be because I know that the, the um, self-flagellation that I'll do afterwards is going to be far more painful than whatever it is that I need to confront. So can you do this? Can you hang hammers? Can you do that? Yes, I can do it. And then work backwards from there to delivering whatever I got to do to deliver a great result. That's it, you know, with whatever it is, but it's, uh, it's good to challenge yourself and can potentially get you in trouble, but yeah. 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 Again, the theme of the program here that I was talking to you about, um, David Anderson's sis sister, Erica yes. Anderson, and just book yes. that she's written, Be Bad First. And you know, it's just willingness, right. just at least to push it a little bit, you know, and realize that if you're not willing to do that, if you're not willing to risk yeah. making a mistake, you're, you're not really going to get better at anything. Um, and I think that's one of the things you really hope. I really hope that this this can be this program can be for people listening to the podcast or just checking things out, subscribing. It I feel like I've been in a situation, you know, maybe you've been there less, I don't know, where it's easy to keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. And know there's another level. It's like, no, I don't have time. You know, I've got all these tuning gigs. I'm making enough money. Why do yeah. I need to learn how to replace a string or regulate or voice or whatever? And, you know, just to have that little, little or a lot of inspiration that keeps driving it into your head. You know what? Maybe you do want to reach for the next level. Why not? why not is is actually as good a reason as any and there's absolutely nothing wrong if you uh have a nice clientele you're you're just tuning and you know there's nothing wrong with just that being enough and it's that in and of itself it's such a great thing this great skill that we have and contribute to people's musical lives but there it is a gratifying thing to kind of nudge yourself to you know, thank God for the PTG and Piano you know, Technicians Guild and these great seminars and and the masters, Eric Johnson's, the the uh, Nick Ravagne's, the Davenport, the Bruce Stevens, these guys who are who are willing to share their higher learning and uh, you know it, it's a it's a deep subject and it really is. There's no end to it. It's it just mm -hmm. as far into the rabbit hole as you want to go, especially with like uh, touch weight, you know, and action geometry and balance weight and um, uh, mad props to all the people who who keep going and going. And I reached a certain level of of uh, voicing kind of became my specialty. And and I feel like that's what I can bring to the table because there's no other aspect of piano technology that has more latitude and it's where the artistry really comes in because there's you know you can you can learn to tune you can regulate and and but when it comes to voicing man there's just, just this wide range of tonal um the tonal spectrum that you can create and one man's ceiling is another man's floor and you'll have Eddie Van Halen, you know, with this, these lacquered hammers that are just harsh and metallic and, Hey Jim, can you make this any brighter for me? <laughs> Ed, this, this thing is already is like ice picks in my ears or uh, Roger Williams. If you remember him, he was a middle of the road pianist and, and uh, wow, this thing is just so bright and it's just so muted and dark and one man's ceiling is another man's floor. So you, mm. You have your own uh, concept of what a good piano tone should be. And then you have, you need to be able to get in their world and to go, well, how does this sound to you? What, how would you describe this on this continuum? You know, it, if this is, if this is clear and this is warm and rich, but also clear and focused, and this is bright and this is harsh and metallic and this is clangy, or this is, dull and dead you know how do you feel this and a lot of times you'll hear people say man this piano is really uh dull sounding and it's it's really harsh but what they're really hearing is that 
there's no sustain, there's no projection. And so then when you deep needle in the shoulders and kind of open that up so that the hammer can come up, hit the string, compress and rebound quickly, then you get this nice blossom to the tone and they go, oh, wow. So sometimes you have, you listen to what they say, but you also kind of lead them a little bit and, and uh, almost invariably, if you give them this nice, rich, warm, balanced tone, but it still has clarity and focus and vibrancy on the high end because the overtone series is now allowed to vibrate freely as opposed to like a, a, a stiff hammer, which will kind of choke off the sound. Um, anyway, what a gratifying thing to be able to deliver for people. Beautiful. Um, I don't, I, I would be remiss if I didn't transition us into what I would, what you call sort of like six, section three of the book here, mm -hmm. um, which is on this theme of kind of continuous improvement, challenging yourself, but it's great because it goes beyond our profession, you know, as piano technicians, it's a theme that we can apply in all sorts of different places. And then you you have this moment in your life where you go, hey, listen, I have, I think I have as an artist something to say, you know. And whether I do or not, whatever, I it, I really owe it to myself, you know, some friends that you've had in your life that were inspirations, to just go for it, to just go say what you need to say out there. Um, so maybe you could talk about. Because that's a big, I, it is a big risk. It's a similar risk. You're doing something and it's working. You're piano tuning and it's working and people like it. And you're friends with these musicians that are recording yeah. and they're cool and that's great and they like you. But what about making that decision? You know what? I have to pursue this. I have to make my own music. I have to put it out there. Tell us about that. Well, part three of the book and a little bit of a spoiler alert, but it it's what changed my life is my best friend, dying of a heart attack at the age of 37. And that shattered me. And it put a flame under my butt with my dreams in a way that nothing else could. I mean, there's always these constant reminders. It's like, no, life is short, man. You got to get on with your dreams. Well, when I was in the hospital room with Claude, as he had had a heart attack or a stroke, and he's unconscious, and I'm holding his cold hand, and I'm remembering just a couple of weeks before my, my buddy Claude, who had become this great songwriter and arranger and songs cut by Celine Dion. And, and he was David Foster's right-hand man and for synth arranging and et cetera. So I'm in his hospital room and I'm holding his cold hand and I'm, I'm remembering, um, Uh, I'm remembering this incredible sonata that he had written that he played for me just a couple of months before. And I was so moved by it. And, he, and here was Claude going, he was going to strike out and he was going to do his first solo album. And I was so proud of him. And I thought, you know, this is, this is uh, going to be amazing. And, but here I am now two months later and, and all those dreams are just kind of floating off into the universe. And I'm, and I'm thinking there are no guarantees of, a, there's no limitless reservoir of tomorrows. So get the hell on with it. And I, I saw how quickly and easily all those things could dissipate. So for me, it took that slap in the face to, for me to really get on with it. And so I've had the, wonderful benefit of having now two careers that that enrich me and I, I get a deep level of gratification to be able to create music so it was when claude died that i said okay these i i i thought i'm if i get that tap on the shoulder and it's it's time to go pencils down assignments in as as is let's go i wanted to go okay i'm going to leave something behind that reflects who I am as an artist and the whole singer songwriter dream had kind of petered out by them and then and it didn't ring true for me well what did ring true was these pieces that I would compose for myself as I'm in between trying to write the next big hit song 
man, it feels so great when I do this little pattern in B minor and then I go to the sharp five and and create melodies that kind of pull from my James Taylor influences and little Dave Grusin and Keith Jarrett and this whole mishmash of, you know, Appalachian stuff. And those felt more real to me. And I thought, I'm going to make a record of these things. And if six people buy this, that's great. I'm, I will feel like I've at least put that into the real world. And, 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 uh, Long story short, it led to uh, this. My first album, Northern Seascape, led to uh, a bidding war for seven from seven labels. Got this <clears throat> massive uh, advance from Angel EMI, Division of Capital Records, and and here I am, you know, ten records later, and it's all piano featured instrumentals, stuff that I composed, and and uh, it's very gratifying for that to be of service to people, just in the same way as that feeling when you have restored a piano and you know that the touch and tone are just fantastic there. And you, you know, somebody sits down, they go, Oh my God, I can't believe it's the same piano. It's that's, they're both equally gratifying. That's great. Um, and I think um, very inspiring and, you know, for myself, I, I think the future, you know, of humanity is in creativity, mm. you know, with, AI coming and technology coming and doing all yeah. these things. It's really one right. of our essential skills to share our authenticity, our true voice, what we have to create. That's what we can do. And, uh, and to, to think any one of us as a human that has that in them is not going to, right? That they're, yeah. that they're going to focus on something else and not share, share that kind of creativity. It's uh, it's, it's sad if that happens. So I, I'm glad that you're there inspiring people and wow. showing that uh, it can, you know, you need to do these things. You need to express yourself out there. And um, and uh, actually, uh, I'll, I'll just tell a quick story. Please. You know, it's, it's, it's a short story, but I, I really appreciated it. So I actually recently went to Tanya Regeer's uh, memorial service. David. And, uh, and, uh, and you and I were both, we, we, we were both at David's actually. And um, great, both great memorial services. So celebratory. Um, they both live such great lives of sharing themselves completely. And uh, there was a bit of a dance party, <laughs> of course. At the, that's the type of uh, memorial it was. Yay. And uh, and this guy that, that I connected with there that was also a friend of theirs. I'm like, I'm about to leave. I'm about to leave. And uh, and he says, you got to stay for one more song. You got to stay for one more song. And he puts this song on, which I actually, I've heard before. And I don't know, you maybe know the artist. It's just called Express Yourself. It's just like, yeah. express yourself, you know, and it's yeah. just kind of like yeah. funky thing. And sure, yeah, yeah. it's a great dance, dance tune. And he starts singing along and just, and you know, everybody's dancing and just expressing themselves. You know, and it's just, it's it's important. It's a very important thing for people people to be able to connect with that and, and go for it. And uh, and the stories you tell about how you're taking that risk and it's actually turning into something special. And not are you just doing it, but I called this incredible studio jazz musician wondering if they're going to say, yes, I'll record that with you. And before you can even spit it out of their mouth, your mouth, I'm recording. Right? Hey, do you want me to play? It? Yeah. You know, it's it's. It's like, yeah, wow. If you're hesitating to do these things, when right around the corner is somebody who can take the words right out of your mouth, right? Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's great. Well, it's, you know, it, yes, it's important to be willing to take those risks. And at the same time, know that they're not always going to just be this magical thing. It yeah, is a risk. Right. Sometimes you're going to fall flat on your face and such is life. But yeah. as as uh david's sister's book says you got to be willing to to take the you know the falls and and the etc got to be willing to fall down well we're right here for at the end of the hour jim it, i what? it could really go on for it forever <laughs> um <laughs> The book's great. I really highly recommend it. Um, it is inspiring. And I think I do think it has, you know, legs to go far beyond the piano community, which is really wonderful uh, for you. I think people will find it just as an inspiring tale, as I said. Um, so go ahead, guys, and click on the 
Amazon pre-order link. And uh, oh, and I'll say I thought about this. Um, if you if you think of it and you send me your pre-order, whatever, there's probably some Amazon code or something. Send me a screenshot and I'll give you uh, a couple uh, months of Piano Tech Radio Hour for just a dollar or something. Right. And we'll try to support that and make you take the extra extra step to go ahead and do it because I highly recommend it and it recommended to your your friends too I think they'll I think they'll enjoy it and you won't regret recommending it um before we go I mentioned Amazon and, and of course it's at Barnes and Nobles and they can go to your website they could just google you and go to your website and find the tuned in link um the tuned in page there any place else you want to send people or actions you would like them to take um as a result of being here I think you've covered the bases. There's you, directly from Amazon or Barnes and Noble, and there's a landing page that tells you more about the book, jimwilsonmusic.com slash tuned in. Okay, excellent. Um, well, it is only an hour long program. Perhaps we'll have you back. You and I will chat some more. Um, and actually, I'll say uh, before we, I'll do the sign off and all this stuff, but um, we'll end the session. So, what we're going to do here now is I'll do the outro. Um, and then we're going to play the remaining 10 minutes of this uh, this prologue to your book. If people are interested, they get a taste of it. My humble reading of it. <laughs> um, no offense, not offended. I loved it. Off. I loved it. <laughs> It'll be me, not you, Jim. But, um, but yeah, you can enjoy that and, and get a little more taste of, of Paul McCartney's world. And um, and we'll jump off. But if you if you after the Zoom sessions ends, if you have a minute, I'll text you. Jump back on Zoom. And we can have a quick chat or we can do that later at some point. But just to give you a heads up yeah. on that. Okay. Wonderful. All right. Um, I'll do our outro. Um, so we have reached the end of another musical journey here at Piano Tech Radio Hour. Thanks to Jim Wilson for joining us today. As always, we're brought to you by Piano Technicians Masterclasses, cutting edge instruction from piano industry masters without leaving your home. If you joined us today for signing up for this session individually, you could make your life easier, more convenient. Subscribe to Piano Tech Radio Hour, $16 a month. You give your Amazon receipt, it's only a dollar for a few months. We'll say three, why not? Three months for just a dollar. Um, you'll get the recording of today's session in our member area, as well as automatic registration for each week's new session. You can sign up at bit.ly forward slash join PTRH. That's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash join PTRH. And so we'll see you all again next week. I'll share the remainder of the, the, the prologue to the book, and we'll jump right on off at that end. Thank you, guys. Thanks for joining. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate you all. Of course. Here we go. Alone in the studio, I hit pause for a second to take in where I am. Hog Hill Mill, an 18th century windmill overlooking the English Channel that Paul's converted into his personal recording studio. Scanning the room, I see the usual trappings, amps, guitars, microphones, an ISO booth where vocals are recorded, rows of console tape with mixer markings stuck on the wall. But this isn't just any studio. It's the Santa's workshop where one of the most extraordinary musical geniuses of our time transforms the ideas in his head into reality. I sneak a closer look at the dozen drawings taped to the wall. Puzzled by these peculiar pictographs, I squint my eyes and try to decipher the first one. I slowly realize this is Paul's clever way to represent his vision of each song's mix. Each graphic is a road map of sorts, using different shapes drawn with felt pens to depict the positioning of each element in the mix. A red circle in the middle represents the vocal. Two green ovals to either side represent the stereo guitars. A black rectangle at the bottom symbolizes the bass. I take in the row of guitars. Ten instruments in a stand is not unusual. I've seen as many in countless L.A. studios. But these guitars... One in particular has a distinctive shape that stops me in my tracks. I hold my breath as I ponder the history of Paul's left-handed Hofner bass, one of the most iconic instruments in all of modern music. What would it have been like to stand?
stand on stage enthralling screaming fans with this Hoffner at Liverpool's Smoky Cavern Club, on the Ed Sullivan Show, in Shea Stadium, or atop the Apple Building at that legendary rooftop concert. Drawing closer, the bass line to Come Together starts playing in my head, followed by Tax Man, then Day Tripper. This instrument has anchored countless Beatles classics. At the Louvre, 15 feet is as close as you can get to the Mona Lisa. Glancing left and right as if there were a dozen standing guard, I reach toward the strings and lightly pluck the low E. Man, if this thing could speak. Late into the night, I work to regulate voice tune and install the Forte MIDI mod, the world's first MIDI adapter for acoustic piano. Just a couple of years earlier, I had the good fortune of having a hand in its development. Bartolomeo Cristofori's pianoforte was fashioned from its meek predecessor, the clavichord, 300 years ago. Now, for the first time, it could connect to the new world of electronics via our adapter. Looking back, it's humbling to think that I, a diffident kid from a small West Texas town, would become part of a bridge from 17th century northern Italy to a recording studio on the south coast of England, belonging to one of the world's most influential recording artists. For many years, I was about the only guy on the planet you could get the MIDI mod from. I had the honor of serving the royalty of rock. Elton John, Phil Collins, Keith Emerson, Pete Townsend, Lionel Richie, Bruce Springsteen. But Paul McCartney had been my first musical hero. I wanted to deliver above and beyond his expectations. It's the wee hours of the night, and I finally wrap up my work. Paul's driver and personal manager, John Hamill, gives me a lift to the Mermaid Inn in the town of Rye. A sign on the building says, Rebuilt in 1400 A.D. The inn dates back to 900 A.D. and had been home to pirates after raiding ships at sea. Blackbeard himself might have roamed these halls. Exhausted, I drift off with visions of merciless marauders dancing in my head. Saturday morning. The skies are a canvas of vibrant blue as my taxi winds its way through the picturesque English countryside. But I'm too preoccupied to appreciate the beauty. Prone to panic attacks, I measure my breath. Somehow, I managed to keep it together yesterday with Paul. But that meeting had been quick and relatively predictable. Today, I need to teach him the features of the adapter. I developed a slick L.A. veneer I can hide my insecurities behind, but as soon as Paul walks in, I drop my guard. He's in a light, playful mood, not an ounce of pretension. I jump into tutorial mode. I point out that his grand now has a MIDI output, which I've connected to a synthesizer that he can trigger from the piano. I show him how to turn on the unit, how to transpose. He sits down beside me on the bench and begins to check out the unique blend of his piano doubled by an electric piano sound. He plunks around, plays a few chords, I switch the synth to a string pad sound, and he varies his chord choices, playing longer held notes. He looks at me and smiles. Lovely. He launches into a chord progression. I've been working on this piece, but I'm stuck for a middle eight section. He plays and sings the verse and chorus he has so far. His voice is competing with the one in my head telling me, This is really happening, so just chill the fuck out and be here. Like a cheeky bastard, (laughs) I step well beyond my boundaries with a suggestion. Fantastic. For the bridge, what about going from C to B7 to E7 to A minor? He tries the chords on for size and stops. Hey, that's me yesterday change. 
Oops. Embarrassed that I'd unwittingly proposed that Paul McCartney plagiarize himself, I laugh and quip, All my chords come back to me in shades of mediocrity. He gets the reference. Paul Simon, right? Great lyric. The morning goes on. I ease into the moment. He's Paul McCartney, but also a great dude. A musician, a kindred spirit with a razor-sharp wit and a limitless reserve of amazing stories. Bouncing around from one topic to another, we talk about his friendship with Jimmy Page, my brother's bout with substances, Paul's recent work with David Foster, whose glowing introduction landed me here. We talk about our mutual friend, Steve Luthecker. No, trust me, Paul, it's Luke out there. And how hanging with Luke was like being a high school kid all over again. We chat about his old Northern England rivals, Jerry and the Pacemakers, an aunt in Liverpool whom I must visit one day if you're ever up north, and his early rock influences. Paul starts playing a Beatles song, and I join in on harmony. Looking back, I recall it being Can't Buy Me Love, but if I'm honest... It's all a bit of a surreal blur. Four hours fly by. When he walks me to the studio door, he smiles and says, Anytime you're in the UK, give us a bell. As the lush green fields of Sussex fly by the limo, a ray of sun lights my face. I catch my smiling reflection in the window. Part of the trick I had played on myself to keep from getting overwhelmed was to convince myself this ain't no big deal. This happens all the time. But that mental Novocaine is wearing off, and I'm shaking my head, laughing, wondering how the hell I got here. I picture my chubby, insecure, seven-year-old self. I wish I could embrace him and reassure him that everything's going to work out. I tell that music-obsessed miscreant from a broken home to just... Hang tough. There'll be plenty of challenges to come, but one day you'll blast off in a rocket ship built for one. You'll share adventures, sessions, meals, and laughs with your heroes, including Paul McCartney, Elton John, Carol King, and Dan Fogelberg. But more important than rubbing shoulders with them, your front row seat will provide you with a rare view of their creative processes that will inspire you on your own musical mission. Dark nights of the soul will push you to your limits, but they'll be the necessary fire that will forge you, helping you tune in to your deepest purpose. You perform to audiences around the world, have chart-topping albums, PBS specials, and your music will be streamed by millions of fans around the globe. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for sticking around. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, it was great to listen back to. Uh, we'll jump off now, and we'll see you again next week. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for giving us an hour of your time. Remember that you can catch us live online every Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. That's right. Go to pianotechradio.com to register so you can interact live and ask questions of our guests. See you next week. Hey, folks. Ethan here with a quick but thrilling commercial interruption. On April 18th at 3 p.m. Pacific Time, 6 p.m. Eastern, we are hosting a masterclass on action geometry with the renowned Dean Rayburn. We host these masterclasses pretty much every third Thursday of every month. You don't want to miss them. You don't want to miss this one. This masterclass will be two extensive parts. Part one will dive into the basics of grand piano action geometry, you can master meticulous measurement techniques to determine radial arms, key ratios, and understand important calculations. In part two, you can apply your knowledge to real-world piano action problems. 
Dean demonstrates practical solutions, including the magic line concept and hammer weight reduction methods. Key features of this lecture include hands-on style learning with Dean Rayburn, a titan of the piano industry, in-depth coverage of action geometry principles and problem-solving techniques, real-world application through troubleshooting and solution demonstrations, and expert insights from Dean Rayburn. That's 45 years of experience in the piano industry. Dean is a seasoned RPT, certified tuning examiner, and a lifelong piano aficionado. With Dean, you are certainly learning from the best. So don't forget to sign up. Visit bit.ly forward slash piano action for more details and secure your spot. That's bit.ly forward slash piano action, bit.ly forward slash piano action.